Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. This JCO podcast provides observations and commentary on the JCO article, Long-Term Results of the International Phase 3 BA06 MRC30894 EORTC, assessing neoadjuvant CMV chemotherapy for muscle invasive bladder cancer by Gareth Griffiths et al. My name is Dr. Mark Begarnik, and I am a clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, USA. My oncologic specialty is urologic oncology with a special interest in prostate, bladder, and testicular cancers. The authors of this manuscript should be congratulated for providing much needed information on long-term outcomes of neoadjuvant chemotherapy with cisplatin, vinblastine, and methotrexate in patients with muscle-invasive urothelial carcinomas, followed by definitive treatment, either cystectomy, radiation, or combination. The work represents a follow-up evaluation of originally reported data in 1999, where the median follow-up was four years. The current follow-up of living patients is now over eight years. My My summary will include four specific topics the important and salient features of the study, the limitations of the study, and additional analyses that could have been performed to help clinicians assess the true importance and context of the work, some surprising findings of the study, and a cautious counterpoint to the optimistic conclusions reached by the authors. The study compared the outcomes of overall survival, disease-specific survival, metastasis-free survival, local regional disease-free survival, and local regional control in a group of 976 patients from 20, from 20 countries with T2, T3, T4A, N0 bladder cancer, who were randomized to receive three cycles of the then-popular cisplatin, methotrexate, and vinblastine chemotherapy program, or no chemotherapy, administered on a 21-day schedule. Post-chemotherapy, patients could receive at the discretion of the individual physician or institution one of three programs, radiation, cystectomy, or pre-op radiation followed by cystectomy. Accrual took place between 1989 and 1995. The original data were first published in 1999, with this new update now in 2010. The main findings were a 16% reduction in the risk of death hazard ratio 0.84 in the CMV group with 10-year survival improving by an absolute increase of 6% in the CMV group. While the results did not satisfy a pre-analysis expectation to achieve at least a 10% survival difference, these data, when considered in light of similar studies, suggest that neoadjuvant chemotherapy might have a meaningful impact in high-risk urothelial cancers. Although toxicity was generally considered to be acceptable, there were five treatment-related deaths from chemotherapy, 16 patients experiencing operative mortality from cystectomy, and one death from radiotherapy. Substantially higher numbers of non-fatal grade 3 and grade 4 adverse events were also noted. It is reassuring that of the total 976 patients from many continents and numerous centers, there was only a total of oh, there was only a total of six patients who were lost to follow-up. The authors in the study coordination centers need to be congratulated on the seemingly impossible feat, given the complexity of the study's organization. There are multiple limitations that deserve mention. 
The first deals with study demographics. It's the number of centers numbered 106. The 976 patients were accrued over about six years, with four centers providing at least 30 patients. Thus, it appears that in the remaining 102 centers, there was an average of only 1.4 patients accrued and randomized per year, and that was derived by 960, 976 patients minus 120 divided by 102 centers divided by six years. It is possible that some centers went for years without randomizing a patient. Was this because of lack of interest or physician or patient reluctance to undergo randomization? Moreover, a sensitivity analysis should have been performed to examine the impact of these highly accruing centers had on overall outcomes. Were the toxicities both from the chemotherapy and surgery clustered in low-volume centers? Second, it is unclear whether there was any standardization to the radiation plan, surgical plans, or what the experience of the pathologists were in specimen interpretation. Were the doses of radiation used during the years of the study comparable to modern-day practices with associated technical advances? I would consider the data less robust if there was no central pathology review, complete with a rigorous criteria for determination of the presence or absence of muscle in the specimen and distinguishing superficial muscularis mucosa from muscularis propria in the biopsy specimen. This is a dilemma that occurs commonly in clinical practice, often leading to the necessity for rebiopsy. The status of the residual bladder tumor post transurethral resection of the bladder tumor prior to randomization was also not described. Was a complete resection of the bladder tumor required or attempted prior to initiation of any treatment, local or systemic, and if so, could this have helped explain the overall results? The most problematic component of the study was the extremely high rate of patients who were assigned to CMV but did not receive the intended three cycles. More than 20%, 99 out of 99 out of 491 patients of those randomized to receive the chemotherapy arm did not receive the intended treatment, including 61 of the 99 patients receiving only one or no cycles. Sensitivity analyses need to be performed with these data sets to help further understand the relevance to overall study conclusions. The two unexpected findings were first the lack of difference in rate of deaths due to bladder cancer in the CMV versus the no-CMV arms, and second, the lack of difference in local regional control in the CMV versus no-CMV arms. Both of these findings raise concern in terms of assigning a direct cause and effect of chemotherapy to overall survival. Since there was no impact on either of these parameters, which might be expected to have been influenced by CMV treatment, Are there other explanations to help account for the overall survival differences? Rigorous analyses exploring variabilities such as comorbidity, extent of adequacy of the transurethral resection of the bladder tumor prior to randomization, assessment of skills of the treating physicians would need to be performed since the obvious explanations of improvement of cancer-specific survival and local control do not provide the needed answers. In summary, I would like to provide some take-home points that might be useful for practicing physicians to consider. The author's conclusion that, quotation, neoadjuvant CMV or MVAC chemotherapy followed by definitive local therapy should constitute the state of the art, end quotation, might be overly optimistic based upon the considerations already discussed. Neoadjuvant therapy should represent one possible and important option in the overall treatment discussion of those with muscle T2 to T4 disease with a full explanation of both the benefits, downsides, and lack of full understanding of the mechanisms underlying the improved outcomes. The modest survival advantage, even if it were to be due completely to CMV chemotherapy, needs to be objectively placed in proper context. For the patient who has just been diagnosed with muscle invasive disease, the urgency of getting the cancer surgically removed or treated with radiation therapy will occupy a primary concern both from the patient's perspective 
and that of the urologist or radiation oncologist. For the medical oncologist to accept neoadjuvant chemotherapy as state-of-the-art, which I interpret to be standard of care, is difficult to reconcile with lack of improvements in local regional control or cancer-specific survival. Had either or both of these parameters been reached, I would be championing these results as practice-changing moment. Further research efforts should concentrate on better understanding which patients might be most likely to benefit from neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the mechanism of action of chemotherapy in this setting. This concludes this JCO podcast. Thank you for listening. For more original research, editorials, and review articles, please visit us online at jco.org. This production is copyrighted to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for listening.